just wanted to make a quick video to show you how I created this cat in pastels. This was actually a commission for my cousin's 18th birthday of her beautiful cat, Lucy. If you have any feedback about the tutorial, I'd love to hear from you. Or if you have any questions, please leave a comment below. And let's get on to the video. I usually start my base layers with pan pastel, but because this is only a 5 inch by 7 inch piece, it would have been a bit hard to use the tools as they're quite large in comparison to the details on the cat. So I started with the pastel pencil straight away. And I use a few different brands which I'll link in the description, but um, it's the Faber Castell Pit, the Caran d'Ache Pastels, the Stabilo Carbothello and the Derwent Pastels. As a general rule of thumb, I usually start with the Pit or the Carbothello as they're slightly harder pastels and will fill up the tooth less than if you went straight in with the softer Derwent or they're even softer Caran d'Ache ones. But if one brand has a colour that I want, I'll just use it anyway. There's no right or wrong way to do things. If it works for you and it doesn't affect the archival properties of the piece, then do whatever you like best, but this is just how I prefer to work. I'm using the Claire Fontaine pastel mat, and this is a sanded paper that comes in many colors as well as white. And I use it for colored pencil a lot as well. I find that you can get quite a lot of layers on the paper. And I used to think that the term sanded meant that your work would look rough or gritty, but it really is the opposite to that. And I love how smooth things turn out. You just have to continue layering until you get the look that you're after. And there is a limit to how many layers of pastel you can add. So just make sure that you do a few test pieces just to get the hang of using the pastels and the paper that you're using before going into a full artwork. And I use the pastel mat because in Australia, I can't access a lot of the other popular brands like the Fisher 400 or the UART easily and if I can get it it's usually ridiculously expensive. Um, pastel mat isn't cheap either but it's definitely worth the money and you can buy it in pads with a variety of colors which is a good way to try it out. I usually buy the large sheets and then cut them to size which works out a bit cheaper in the long run but it is a bit of an investment. The pastel mat is quite a thick card but you can purchase it mounted as well and I prefer it mounted because it's easier to work on because it doesn't curl up on the edges and there's less chance of damaging it when it's finished by creasing it and things like that. Um, plus I feel like it gives a more solid and professional feel to your piece but that's just personal preference. There's no difference in the quality of the paper whether it's mounted or not. So as with all my pieces, I've started by blocking in the main colours, making sure that I'm going darker than what the end result needs to be so that I can add lighter colours on top in the next few layers. This is a black and white cat, and I know that some people find it difficult to draw black or white animals. And when I draw black or white animals, I'm always looking out for those extra hidden colours in the fur, like the blues and purples and reds and you you mainly find those in the highlights and in the shadow areas and I personally tend to exaggerate those colors to give it some more interest than what the reference photo usually shows and it depends on what lighting your subject is in to which colors show up in the black or white fur but you'll usually see bits of the background colors reflecting hints in your fur as well if I'm struggling to see those hidden colours, sometimes I hype up the saturation on the reference photo really high. That can sometimes help you see some of those hidden colours. Obviously I wouldn't create my artwork to look like the really saturated reference, but you can generally see more colours this way, which helps you see them in your original reference photo. Another way is to use a program like Photoshop or just the paint program and use the eyedropper tool to select an area in your photo. This way you can see the color that you're looking at as it can sometimes be completely different to what you thought it was, but it's a good way to find those blues and purples in the fur. It's a good way to show you exactly what colors are in the fur, not what you think you can see. I'm using a cotton tip to blend the pastel throughout the piece. You can use a bunch of things like shapers, soft tools, your fingers or tissues to blend out the pastels, or you could leave it and not blend it at all. But I find that by blending it out and pushing the pigment into the tooth of the paper, which allows me to add more layers, plus it gives a softer look in the end because it looks less gritty along the way. In this piece, I started with the eyes and there wasn't really a reason why I chose to do them first. Doing the eyes is my favourite part of any piece because I believe it can really give the piece some life and look more realistic. 
You can start with whatever part you want though, there's no rules for that. A lot of people start with the background, so when you get to your main subject, you can overlay strands of fur over the background so it doesn't look like a cut and paste onto the background. Some people combat this by working in sections and completing it fully before moving on to the next section, like working in square inches. But I find that I forget which colours I used and then when I go to the next section it doesn't quite match and I don't really want to sit there and write a list of all the colours that I use because honestly I use between 50 and sometimes over 100 colours per piece. So I find that the easiest way for me to work is by completing a light layer of the entire piece or entire subject or a part of the piece that I want to complete and then I rest my hand on some glassine or tracing paper or printer paper so that I don't smudge the work as I go and then I slowly build up the layers from there. This way I don't have to remember which colours I've used because I would have made each layer cohesive as I go along by putting that one colour in multiple areas over the entire piece or area or subject and therefore I can use whatever colour I feel like in the next layer without worrying if it matches each section of the piece. And once I have a few layers down, I start making sure that my values are correct. You can see me use some pastel sticks in the lighter areas or darker areas instead of using the pastel pencils. And this is just because the sticks that I'm using are generally softer than the pastel pencils, which means that they'll easily lay on top of the pencils, which will give a brighter highlight or make an area darker if necessary. And sometimes I use this technique if I need a color to really pop as well. The sticks tend to look a lot more saturated in color as well. Earlier in the video, I talked about looking for those blues and purples and other colors in the black and white fur. And you saw me adding a lot of blues to the black part of the fur. And now that it's all blended out and looking more like a cat, the fur still looks black, but the blues really help stop the color looking flat. I see a lot of people trying to add white as highlights to black fur or grey as shadows to white fur and in both cases it will most likely age your subject as it turns out looking like grey hairs instead of highlights or shadows. So paying attention to what colour your highlights and shadows actually are can stop this from happening to your piece and this is where that eyedropper tool will help you out. And as I'm getting towards the end, I'm adding more and more details like the whiskers and any little strands of fur. And this is also where I'm starting to look really closely at my reference photo to see if there's any last minute changes I need to make. This is really important if you're doing commissions like this one. It really needs to look like your subject. So you can't have as much artistic license as you would with, you know, a tiger, for example, where you could put a stripe in a different spot and it won't really matter as long as it's the, in the general shape of the rest of them. So this is usually where I spend a lot of time making sure that the markings are in the right spot and that kind of thing. And this is also where you can take a photo of your artwork and turn it into black and white and then compare it side by side with a black and white version of your reference photo just to make sure that your values are correct. And this is really important for realism if that's what you're trying to achieve. It's more important than colour. I can't remember where I heard it from but there's a saying that goes, uh, colour gets all the credit but value does all the work. And that is so true and that's got to be one of the most important things when working in realism just to keep an eye on your values and if you are struggling with your values i suggest doing a few works in black and white alone and not only does it look really nice in black and white anyway but it really helps you see those values this is the most satisfying part for me which is taking the tape off and I just use a acid free masking tape around all of my pieces just so that i can have that little border to hold on to or to make it easier to frame. Before I put the tape onto my actual artwork, I usually just put it onto my clothing first so that it removes some of the tack of the masking tape so that when you go to pull it off it's not ripping any of the paper. And when you do pull it off, make sure you do it really slowly and carefully. I have a few more videos already with some tips and tutorials if you wanted to check them out. If you have any questions or feedback, Leave a comment below because I'd love to hear from you guys and make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss out on any future videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.